table on private equity operational improvement. I'm John Marino, senior editor at The Deal, and we're here today to discuss a variety of topics. Joining us is Ken Hanna. He's a partner at 3i. Jim Anderson, co-founder and managing partner at Clearview Capital. And Bruce Fenton, he's a partner with Pepper Hamilton. Gentlemen, thanks for joining us today in our New York studios. And to our viewers, thank you for tuning in. Bruce, I want to lead off with you here. Um, yesterday, or rather last week, I should say, in Las Vegas, uh, Pepper Hamilton debuted its Operational Improvement Trends Survey, and it says that more operators are focusing on operational improvements before they sign the LOI. Um, uh, what do you draw from the DD process that gets you on the right track? Well, uh, there, there are really uh, two things. Uh, the first one is the, the substance of the diligence process uh, uh, can certainly inform uh, where there's uh, areas for operational improvement. Uh, for example, uh, part of the process, I mean, in addition to the legal diligence, uh, there's financial diligence uh, uh, in industrial uh, uh, verticals. You've got uh, diligence on, on machinery in, in uh, uh, an IP heavy uh, mm -hmm. vertical, you would have IP related diligence. So certainly the diligence itself can highlight areas in which uh, there are weaknesses uh, with uh, the company's operations. But kind of taking a step back a little, uh, you, you can actually look at the whole diligence process uh, kind of uh, from a 40,000 foot perspective and uh, get an idea as to certain areas of, of potential operational improvement. So for example, if the process goes smoothly, uh, if all the information that you'd want in the data room is in the data room, if your requests are handled uh, efficiently and uh, appropriately, chances are you either have a fabulous investment banker managing the process or the management team really knows what they're doing. But if you've got those kind of glitches in the process, that may actually point to weaknesses within the management team that you know, these guys on the PE side could then focus on. On the PE side, what do you have to say? Yeah, I mean, um, look, we're in an environment where the where pricing is very, very full. They're, right. You're being required to pay that price scale, use a lot of leverage. So um, I think you have to be very disciplined about how you're looking at these businesses. And so we are, we are earlier in the process looking at, at operational improvement opportunities. Gives you great insight to how management thinks because all this, this operational work you'll do will be in collaboration with management. You have opportunity to see some red flags, but also some upside because, you're, because you are paying a full price. You really want to identify areas of opportunity and do that early so that you think you have some real angles as you go through the process. And we want to make sure that when the deal closes, we know what we're going to do. Right. Um, not to say that things won't change throughout the life of the investment, but the diligence process, we will identify opportunities for the, really to, to, to improve value over time. All right, and, and uh, I, I guess uh, Ken and then Jim, um, talk about I mean, I guess maybe your your middle market approach versus your lower middle market approach, and I'm curious to see if there's any contrast or how that varies between the two of you. Sure. Um, are we focused uh, on businesses five, kind of 15 to 50 of EBITDA? Okay. I don't know how the middle market's defined anymore, but um, <laughs> you know, I guess we're squarely in the mid market, and I think look, to be a lot of common ground with the, with the way we approach things. Um, I think size of fund and the competitive dynamics, because of size of fund, there may be some differences. We actually, we have about 70 professionals between Europe and the U.S. at 3i, and, and we actually do some in-house training for what we call active partnership, We're focused on operations, what we call spotting and scoping. Um, I don't know if that would be different from potentially what you sure. guys are doing, but um, we, will, we will now in these processes spend money earlier um, with consultants. Um, and you just kind of the nature of these competitive processes today, we're trying to avoid them, but they're hard to avoid, you know, is calling for that. And then really post um, acquisition, we will use, um, we'll use consultants as well as appropriate. Again, all this is in collaboration with management. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times founders struggle with that. And, and, and so, and I think in a lot of situations, I think as you skew smaller, you know, that might be a difference in, in how, how much receptivity there is to that type of thing. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. We, we, at Clearview, we really focus traditionally on companies 10 million EBITDA and less. Mm -hmm. uh, these are companies that do one or two things really well and have had a lot of success because of that, but they very often hit, hit a wall because they haven't been completely professionalized. Yeah. So when we think of operational improvement, 
Uh, we typically aren't, for example, uh, knocking cost out because we found wasted cost. There almost never is any at these small, very lean businesses. Uh, we're typically adding, adding cost in the form of potentially one or two additional managers. Almost always, for example, we're going to put a CFO, CFO in place because it wasn't there before. Because without the CFO, we can't upgrade the systems. Without the systems, we can't track the right metrics. These kinds of really basic building blocks of running a professional business typically have been done if the company's 20 or 30 million of EBITDA. Mm -hmm. right. Very often, the companies we get into, they're good companies, but they haven't completed that step yet. So that, that's, I think, really maybe the contrast yeah. between the kinds of companies that we're looking at. Bruce, what are you seeing in, in your experience, you know, since you kind of get to look at the whole spectrum, really? Yeah, the, uh, uh, the, the size of the fund is, is not only a, uh, an indicator uh, or, or a driver of uh, what the, the size of the target uh, might be and therefore what the diligence uh, uh, process might be and therefore what operational improvement opportunities might come out of the diligence process. But you also have, have the issue that the size of the fund uh, is, is frequently a driver of what sort of internal resources exist at the fund. So uh, the, it got uh, popular as a buzzword probably at this point five, six, seven years ago, but uh, operating partners are something you hear a lot about. Uh, to the extent uh, either uh, a particular fund is large enough to uh, bring in operating partners and either uh, put them on the payroll at the fund level or at the port, uh, have the portfolio companies pay for them. Uh, that's something that typically you're only going to get at a, a larger private equity group right. or a smaller private equity group that's still harvesting at two or three funds so that they can share expenses. Interestingly, uh, just in the last day or so, uh, the SEC uh, had a, uh, a pronouncement about these operating partners uh, and they announced that they are going to be looking very closely at who's paying for those operating partners. And uh, it, it, it mostly becomes a disclosure issue, but the issue in a nutshell is uh, if you have an, an operating partner that is serving uh, a multitude of portfolio companies, but all of that is being expensed out to the portfolio companies um, and not coming out of the GP's uh, uh, allotment in the, in, in, in the fund documents for fund expenses, uh, the SEC believes that that might be misleading to the LPs. Uh, they, they contrast that with uh, operating partners who focus uh, really only on one portfolio company, which I guess even the SEC acknowledges that that, that would be appropriate. So uh, it's interesting. It's probably a theme we'll come back to a little in the next you know, 40, 45 minutes or so, the how uh, the, the drive for operational efficiency uh, kind of sometimes conflicts with uh, the need uh, for compliance uh, and, and, and the need to make sure that uh, the, the LPs uh, understand what they're, what they're getting involved in. But the, the direct answer to your question is the larger the fund, the more resources that are available, the more resources that are available, the more that can be done in-house, and the more expertise that can be built up internally. And I mean, just for the purpose of our viewers who are watching, what you're referring to is the ongoing SEC investigation into private equity funds, correct? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, moving along, I, I want to turn back to you on this one because it's your survey. Um, one, of, one of the things that... It's our survey. Anybody can... It belongs to the, the people now. But thank you. Thank you. It is a citizen of the earth. Then. That's right. That's right. One of the things that the survey says, and I'm curious to know why they feel this way, is that GPs say that... Um, now, operational improvement is, is more important earlier on than it was in terms of their thinking, more than they thought before the financial crisis took effect. So I'm curious why that is. Well, uh, I, I, again, as, as, as Jim said there, uh, or Jim and Ken's conversation, there, there, there may be some variations on the general theme due to uh, where in the middle market uh, the, the fund exists and what the size of the fund is. but. 
Uh, my general answer is these days the deals that are getting done uh, are generally uh, higher quality deals. Mm -hmm. Those higher quality deals are uh, getting done at higher multiples. Uh, what that means, they're, they're generally quite competitive. Uh, it's, it's generally uh, the deals that are getting funded uh, by, by uh, senior and MES uh, debt sources, again, generally are the higher quality uh, uh, targets. So what's happening is private equity groups are paying more for the inventory that's out there than they may have been previously. And there's less inventory out there uh, to that, that they find attractive. So what's happening is uh, they're making bigger bets on these companies, and therefore uh, it's, uh, it's really important that they're able to maximize the uh, improvements, uh, the, the, the EBITDA improvements over the life of the investment so that when uh, it comes time to exit, uh, they're uh, making their IRR targets or exceeding those IRR targets because these days uh, you, know, you can't guarantee that every investment's going to be a home run. Uh, the other aspect of that is uh, when, when private equity was invented, uh, you could make money two ways. You could make money just paying down debt or you could make money by, uh, well, three ways, improving the company or you could make money just by smushing enough EBITDA together that you get to one of those magic multiple levels where you know, a, a, a five multiple suddenly is a seven multiple just because it's a bigger company. Uh, uh, what, what I'm seeing and, and what I'm hearing is that it's much more difficult to make money by uh, relying on, on paying down of debt. So you really do need to drive the operational improvements. Jim, is that also your experience in the lower middle market? Because I got the sense from when we spoke earlier that your fund strategy has kind of been consistent over time. It has been consistent over time. I do think the multiples have gone up. Uh, and I don't think it really has anything directly to do with the financial crisis. I think it's just over time uh, it's become a much more competitive, um, much more efficient marketplace. Uh, we still have, and always have been driven almost entirely by growth. We buy a company under 10 million of EBITDA, typically is going to be at a lower multiple. If you can look back over many, many years, all the statistics will show you that multiples rise with size. Mm -hmm. uh, but we still want to be able to drive, drive growth to, to, and not really rely on debt reduction. Um, we don't pay eight, nine, and 10 times multiples. We generally don't have to. Mm -hmm. uh, but we will still see multiples increase in our marketplace, but not so much that it really needs, forces us to change our strategy. What's your opinion? Yeah, I mean, look, operational improvement was important before the crisis. And it's right. important now in, in our business. I think there's de definitely, as the whole industry has gotten a little bit more institutional, I think there's more focus on it, and for good reason, as we've talked about the pricing and the efficiency, the margin of safety is really thin. I also think, even though it was amazingly five years ago now, I mean, it was a, you know, when industrial, December 08 to March 09 was incredibly <laughs> dark. I mean, it was frighteningly dark. And I think, you know, we remember that, and, and hopefully we always will. And so, it's not only thinking about upside, but what levers are you going to have to push and, and, and play with if, if things move quickly in the other direction? And I think you have to be extremely nimble um, in what is an incredibly competitive environment. All right. Um, I'll turn back to you, I, I guess, for this one. Sure. It, it, is it it's, easy? It's, pretty easy. <laughs> I feel like it's pretty easy, but right. you, you tell me. Right. Most investors start incurring expenses against assessing operational improvements earlier in the deal process. I'm curious to know what the advantage is to this. Yeah, I mean, again, I think some of this, and, and both Bruce and Jim alluded to it, is a little bit of the competitive dynamics of what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, and, and certainly people are spending money earlier. Um, but I think there's some real merit to that, and it was for the reasons we talked about earlier, which is you want to get a better sense for what's management's capabilities, how they think about things, are you aligned with them? Mm -hmm. What are the red flag issues that you want to identify early? Importantly, what's the upside? Because ultimately, why do you have the God-given right to probably have to pay the highest price to prevail in a lot of these competitive situations? And so do you have real angles around you know, how you can drive the sales force around what are some of the opportunities on the, on the, on the operational side? Um, with international expansion is something that we focus a lot on at 3i. So it is increasingly important before you then decide to take that next step and spend even additional money 
that you have a really clear view of what you think the plan is going to be, what the 180-day plan plus is going to look like. We'll get into that. But, you know, I think that's why people are spending money sooner now. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, we, we want to be able to hit the ground running. It's really important. T time is not your friend, if you will. Right. Uh, we want to know what we think we, we can do with the business and what the right approach is. Right. So, so it's, you really do have to start ahead of time. And in more competitive processes, uh, the, the, the other thing that the kind of un, unknown secret about our deals is the highest price doesn't always win. Um, but certainty of close is certainly important. And if you've done a lot of work up front and right. demonstrated your real desire to own a business, particularly uh, with smaller businesses yep. that are founder-owned, it goes a long way. And, and I'm not saying that you're going to get a big discount, but Ty will go to the runner for certain. If you've done the work and you've shown the founder that you have something to bring mm -hmm. to the situation, really uh, it can make a very big difference in whether you close that deal or not. And at the end of the day, we don't know, need to close a lot of deals. just have to close the right ones. Well, I think the, uh, the, the points that both Ken and Jim have made that can't be uh, overstated is uh, the efficiency of the process. Uh, the, uh, investment bankers have, generally speaking, done a very good job over, whether you say the last 10 years or 20 or 25 years, whatever it is, of creating more efficient auctions, which creates more competition, which uh, I believe not only drives up uh, prices, but also does exactly what, what, what you guys were talking about. It, it forces you to distinguish yourself earlier in the process. And you can distinguish yourself early by having the highest bid, but that just means uh, you're going to have to drive even more value during your holding period in order to successfully exit. So if there are other ways you can distinguish yourself, and particularly, uh, yeah, forgive me for not knowing this, but uh, uh, particularly I would imagine with founder-owned uh, businesses, uh, is rollover a, a part of, of your strategy? Almost, almost always. So they, right. they, they have to know that they're going to be in partnership or a marriage exactly with someone that right. is going to help the business succeed, but also, and maybe, maybe the most important thing, they're going to want to feel comfortable that you can help them if something bad happens. Because the one thing we always tell uh, actually our LPs and our potential management partners is, no matter how much diligence we do, no matter what the model says, that's not what will happen. That's not right. Bad. right. <laughs> Something different will happen. Hopefully it will be better things, but if it's not, how will you react? And it, it's very important for your partners to be comfortable that you will know how to act in a storm because they're likely to happen. That's exactly right. I mean, a lot of uh, founders uh, are uh, kind of a little allergic to debt. This mm -hmm. may be the first significant leverage that's been put on uh, a, a lower middle market company. Uh, that makes them a little nervous. Uh, the fact that, that these guys can sit across the table with the founder and talk to the founder in their language, understanding the founder's issues, maybe mm -hmm. even better than the founder does. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are all sorts. I, I was just having this conversation yesterday uh, with a friend of mine at a business lunch. Uh, you don't have to answer the question because a founder may think you're thinking about a current deal. But how many situations have you been in in which uh, uh, founder's management team is all family? Sure. And, uh, or ma mostly, ma mainly family. and mm -hmm. and. Uh, one of the family members may be dynamite and the other two have to go. Right. Um, I mean, huge operational improvement right there, but without the relationship, without the understanding, without uh, the ability to sit across the table and really connect with that founder, uh, that's a disaster scenario if you want to buy that business. So. They can call them, you know, the human capital officer or something like that. Give them a wonderful office. That, that would be my suggestion, but I, I'm not running your businesses. Um, we, we've got now from our viewers, and also this is a reminder for our viewers to please use the chat box in your window to ask questions and participate. Our first question is coming from TC, and TC asks, and actually I, I would probably appreciate it if you guys wanted to break this down across a number of industries. Uh, what's the average range of EBITDA multiples that private equity <laughs> investors want to pay right now? That is the most common question we get asked. Uh, we get asked and by, the number by seems everybody. to go up, right? Well, I, 
It's really hard to answer that because the, the value value that anybody's willing to pay for a particular business comes has so many factors. Mm -hmm. Companies that grow faster are typically worth more. Companies that are very capital efficient are typically worth more. Higher margin businesses are worth more. Defensible businesses are worth more. But you can be anywhere along the spectrum of those kinds of companies. Uh, I think what we've seen in, in our marketplace, um, uh, we, you know, the businesses that we've uh, acquired recently, good businesses, we've been able to, to, to buy in the six to seven times range, sometimes lower. Um, we, but I know that there's some companies that we really enjoyed. We looked at and we thought they were great and we, in, in our minds, uh, put, put forth a pretty hefty proposal and weren't invited to the process. Uh, I think it's a, it may be more volatile range now than I can remember, mm -hmm. uh, with some companies going for much bigger numbers than you would expect. Right. Um, but it, it's really hard to say a number, it's just not really, that, that, that question, that, that answer doesn't have a lot of relevance really. It yeah. seems to shake out even sector by sector within a sector because if you, if sure. you look at foods, for example, up until very recently, the organic food space was white hot and you were seeing folks get sold, you know, 10, 11, 13x EBITDA multiples. Yeah. But now with what's happening to Whole Foods and public markets, I'm not sure that that's going to hold up long term. Right. I'm sorry, what was your point? Well, I'm sorry, John, but it, it, may, it really depends with even within in sub-segments. So industrial is obviously pretty vast, but, you know, automotive multiples are, are still probably in that, you know, six to seven times range, sometimes lower. Industrial tech business, high margin defensibility. Much you know, we've seen double digits. I mean, what we were talking about before we came on is almost across the board, you're seeing a turn to a turn and a half higher than what we would describe as a norm for guys that have been doing this for 20 years. True. Um, and so, you know, eight and a half or eight, eight and a half is, is the new seven, you right. know, I mean, and it's, and it's a little bit daunting in that regard. So certainly we've seen multiples across the board higher than almost we've historically ever seen. But I think the relationship of multiples with size, I don't think really, I think it's, it's held. Smaller companies right. trade, trade at lower multiples than larger companies, everything else being equal, and it, it's a pretty steep curve, actually. Right. Yeah, and I mean, I feel like this kind of circles back to your point about people in the PE industry paying more for assets now and kind of having to do their homework a little bit earlier in the investment cycle. Um, I just want to jump back now to our readers again, and I, I, or rather our viewers, they're, they're submitting another question. Um, Carter asks, do you, see the trend of, do you see the trend toward operational improvement impacting the length of a holding period? I'm not sure that that necessarily fits right now because it seems like there's so much more money in the private equity space that people are trying to do more deals and it's a little bit easier to, to sell an asset after a three-year hold. Well, we went through a period of time it, 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 yeah. with the middle of that, that December 08 through March 09 period, but that kind of two, almost three year period that lengthened everybody's holding periods because right. the, the world was a really difficult place in which to operate. Uh, companies didn't grow like we wanted them to. Uh, so I think that dragged out holding periods. I think a very good uh, operational improvement, improvement plan can shorten a holding period because if you can take advantage of those opportunities and drive growth over the short term, then you should be able to exit more more quickly. But I still think the three to five or six year uh, holding period, which people have talked about for a long time, is still probably relevant. Yeah, I mean, the, and, and I agree with all that. Interesting enough, though, that if you feel like there's a business that you have operational opportunities over a longer period of time, you know, you might want, if you can compound money at 20 plus percent, yeah, keep doing because it. it's so hard to buy new assets, you might want to hold. We, we had to sell an asset last year that we had for five and a half years. We would have loved to have hold continue to hold, but because of fund dynamics and the like. And, and so it, 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 but it cuts both ways. It's so opportunistic, depending on the deal and the situation. I think yeah. it's, you know, it's hard to say there's any trend there. You can uh, see. I don't think so. You uh, mentioned that, uh, John, that we spoke of intergrowth. Uh, one of the things that uh, I, I had some fun doing was one of the round tables uh, that they had at the conference was, uh, which I kind of led the round table. It, it was on what strategic acquirers want. What they're looking for, and and one of the trends. And I know this is this is about PE. I'll, I'll get to it. Uh, uh, one of the trends we identified was the fact that a lot of uh, the larger strategics are are not uh, inter as interested these days in fixing up companies. Uh, they actually want the PE funds to do that. They want to That's buy true. companies. And, and it goes beyond Sarbox. I mean, Sarbox, uh, have, having the uh, information systems, uh, the, the MIS in place was a, a huge issue 
uh, for the regulatory reason. But in terms of operational efficiency and improvements, what these strategics are looking to do is they're, if, if, if you imagine some of these larger companies as a jigsaw puzzle, and they have, it's a 100-piece jigsaw puzzle, and they have 92 of the pieces, and they are literally looking for those other eight pieces, and those pieces have a particular shape and a particular size, particular characteristics. They're not looking for just another acquisition. They're looking for an acquisition that fits that niche. And so these guys, have a great opportunity if that company is in their portfolio and they've spent the time and they've done what they need to do in order to do the strategic's job for them, mm -hmm. the sky's the limit in terms of pricing. That's the home run that, dry, that can drive a fund's IRR through the roof. Uh, and it's, it's, it's real, uh, it's, it's uh, something I've, I've talked to a lot of bankers about. They're seeing it as well, I don't know. You know, on the exit side, if you guys uh, have, have, have seen that, but it's something for the right private equity group to take advantage of. It, it, can, it can be a game changer. Yeah. All right. uh, for private equity firms, they're finding that after investments have been made, senior manager skills are said to be weaker than what was originally thought, and I guess we kind of touched on this a little bit earlier with the family members. What happens once you're there? I mean, it, we, we pretty much expect uh, in, some, in some places, like for example, in the financial function, we almost always know that the person we have in that spot that we've acquired mm -hmm. won't be strong enough. That's right. almost always the case. So we're pretty well prepared to, to replace people where needed. But you do have to be very careful, particularly in smaller businesses, about culture. Mm -hmm. um, we, we rarely go into a, a situation where we think the CEO isn't strong. Uh, because the risk that you take in a small company when you're replacing one, even one, of maybe three or four really key people can be very, very high. So we have to be very careful about that. So we go through a very deliberate process of making sure we understand what the cultural fit is of anybody that we bring in. Mm -hmm. uh, we think very hard about that. And even when we think very hard and we think do a very good job of diligence around a person, you can still be wrong. Uh, it's, it's, it's the, I think, my, my opinion, the most difficult thing that we do is making sure we have the right people in the right positions that fit with the culture of the business. And, and that's, I think, important at almost every level. I mean, unfortunately, business is still about people and, and who's running these businesses and leadership, culture, cohesiveness. I think we, we, every situation is different, but I think we, when we do get into these situations, a lot of time the, the, the owner operator, the, 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 the professional manager, um, will sometimes resist some of the operational initiatives. Yeah. By the way, we don't always get it right. <laughs> no. <laughs> we get it half right, maybe. But, well, I'm sorry uh, for that. <laughs> um, but, you know, again, this is all about collaboration. This is not something you're trying to jam on your executives. I mean, if, right. you know, and sometimes they won't buy in, and, and it's a, it's, you're working through that together. It doesn't always go well. We can talk about that and how you deal with that. But, you, you know, at the end of the day, um, Oftentimes, these operators may be a little too close to the business, and an outside perspective it can be helpful. Mm -hmm. right. But it's 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 a collaboration, and it will only be successful if if such. We don't, for example, purposely put in place hundred day plans. Right. We don't call them out on purpose yeah. because these things do take time. Even if we have a very clear idea what we want to do, we have to make sure the organization is ready. Right. And sometimes that means making investments first. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in, for example, in a CFO in improving their systems, making sure that they've got the right metrics in place, then we think about that next stage, and that can take time. Uh, trying yeah. to jam it into an organization generally is going to be a mistake. Yeah. Now, actually, we, we, we put a lot of credence in the what we call 180-day plan, right. um, and we share that, um, and there's the same challenges. I mean, there, again, there's no panacea here, but you know, we, in fact, we have a review tomorrow on a company we bought last fall on, on how they're doing against that plan as an mm -hmm. investment committee. But, and, and we're working closely with the management team and the board to, to try to drive that, to hopefully set the table. That, that, again, that's only 180 days or 100 days, and then from there you're re-looking at short-term and long-term plans. But we would, try to, we would try to live to those. We, we're, we don't always get that right either. But. Well, uh, Ken's point about the board actually is an excellent point. Yeah. You guys may want to talk about uh, uh, how you bring in uh, outside directors in order to provide mentoring or uh, you know, kind of industry expertise in a non-threatening way. I mean, it's certainly threatening to take a founder and make him president and bring in a CEO, but if you've right. got a 
non-executive chair who might be an industry leader or an industry expert who can kind of after board meetings uh, kind of hang around and, and, and mentor this founder even though the founder may have been running the business for 30 years sometimes it fits better into the culture that, that Jim was talking about. And I, you know, is, is that it's technique you this guys is a, use? This is a place that I think the, our brethren have very different views on how mm -hmm. they can think about board yeah. construct. And, we, we, and some of this from our European influence, but we, we use non-exec chairs. Um, and and we, we, don't, we don't want big boards. I mean, so we'll have one or two outside operating types. Um, and the chair can be a little bit of a coach in between, but we're not we want to rely on that completely because it's important for us to have a good relationship. But we have seen the success of having one or two outside operators who can, you know, relate to the situation, willing to get their hands dirty, but hopefully have seen some things that can help drive the business. I mean, we have the same approach. We put one or two on the board. Yeah. The, the challenge for us is, is finding someone uh, who can make the transition, particularly if they've been in the, uh, a long career yeah. of managing businesses, from being in charge to being an advisor. Right. And not they can't right. all do that. Right. 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 Uh, but that, that's the challenge, because the guy who's used to being in charge starting to dictate to, again, a family-type business, um, that can be a cause of a lot of irritation. All right. Um, when you have... Uh, deep involvement by an operating partner for a prolonged period of time, especially on the senior management team. But what does that say about the CEO or the senior management? Does that say that, that they're maybe deficient, but they're still running a perfectly successful and a healthy business? Or what, I guess, would you draw from that, you know, if, if, the, if the operating partner kind of has to move in and knock him home and see his family for six months? Well, if the operating partner's making decisions that the CEO should be making, clearly there's a problem. But um, I don't... Th I don't, I don't think there's really anybody out there who, who, who wouldn't benefit from accepting good advice. So we, we, like I said, we don't use the, the true operating partner model. It's much more of an advisor model from the board level. Mm -hmm. But our, our boards are pretty active, and we, we do stay, in, in, stay pretty well involved. And it doesn't mean the CEO is bad, but you know, these are complex organizations. And, and having good advice, uh, even if there's one person in charge on a day-to-day -day basis, is, is valuable. Yeah, we probably wouldn't, it would be probably a bad sign if you were jetting in an operating <laughs> partner to do day-to-day -day stuff, but we will use consultants mm -hmm. for specific projects, which is probably a, little, a place, you, you, operating folks typically don't love consultants either, so <laughs> you know, you gotta, you gotta work on that. <laughs> but um, if it's a pretty complicated project around supply chain or something where you may need some outside resources, probably a little bit more palatable to the operator. But if, if, if one of us is getting involved in it, then it's really a problem. But, and if there's an operating partner getting involved, it's a problem that yeah. needs to be addressed. And sometimes it's, it's a good thing, as you said. If, right. if, if you're uh, uh, putting a, uh, a brand new distribution center in for uh, businesses where that would be applicable, or, or you're rolling out uh, uh, a major new technological initiative, and uh, yeah, you've got a founder who created a great business and got paid a lot of money for that business and has that 20% rollover and quite frankly expects to make more on the 20% exit than that founder made on the 80% initial liquidity event. All that's great stuff, but that founder may not really, I mean, it may have been a regional business and a couple of add-ons later it's now uh, half the country or nationwide or or it can with your companies, maybe international, that founder may not have any experience in that area as, uh, at all. So parachuting that person in may not necessarily be a sign of, of a problem that has to be corrected. It may actually be a wonderful opportunity to create uh, a lot of revenue, a lot of which drops to the bottom line for these guys. Yeah. Right. So is there a benchmark for our private equity firms evaluate portfolio company performance, or is it really just kind of on a one-by-one -one basis? Well, I mean, I think every situation is dependent on the industry, too. It can be very different on what KPIs, you know, the key performance indicators that you're looking at. Um, we, because we spend a lot of time in industrial, we, we spend a lot of time on return on capital um, is, is a big criteria, but it, it's a hard one to answer because it, it's going to depend. Yeah. Growth is key, obviously. Investors pay for growth. Um, but it can be, you know, we'll get pretty granular too in the interface with management and the board and what kind of metrics we're looking at. But it's very, it's very company specific. Yeah, it's, I agree. I don't have a lot to add, really. Yeah. No. Uh, I, I, 
I agree. <laughs> so during the process of due diligence, some of the things investors say take precedence are, and this is according to your study again, uh, supply chain improvement, marketing improvement, and sales execution. A, Y, B, do you agree? Well, I, I mean, I, I guess I, I agree. Those are, those are places that very often are weaknesses in companies. Uh, but again, every situation is different. We've had companies that were, it was entirely about sales, others, others where it was about supply chain only and where they really had issues. And uh, we have a couple companies that are really, they're terrific operating companies. The issue is just, it's gonna get bigger and it's all about tucking acquisitions. So I think, you know, our job as, as the investor is to determine what the right places to spend our, our time in are. Um, as I said, in most of our companies, the, the first place that's a, that's a weakness and that drives all other operational improvement is just measuring everything better, putting the right CFO in place, making sure that you have the right systems to measure the things you need to and then measuring them. Once we've done that, which again, in, in larger companies probably already been done, then those other things come to the fore. All right. Yeah, I would just add, I, mean, I totally agree. I think historically it's been a lot of focus on cost. You, know, you take a dollar out, it's worth eight to 10 times that when you, when you go to right. sell it. If, um, there, there are other operational uh, areas that are easier to, to uh, monitor. So procurement, if, you know, if you can take, if you can buy better, you can see immediate payback, pricing increases. But we, we've seen the benefit here, particularly of late, uh, of really focusing on the front end. And, and, and at the end of the day, sales and, and revenue growth, so we talked about, drives valuation. And it can be a little bit longer term, mm -hmm. a little bit harder to do, change culture, sales force effectiveness type programs. Mm -hmm. and, um, but obviously the benefit of that can be significant if you can you know, help drive that top line by doing some operational improvement. All right. Um, are private equity firms only interested in direct financial returns or are indirect non-financial returns also being considered? Um, you know, for example, and this comes from one of our viewers, J.A., um, are sustainability, sustainability, stakeholder perception, or health and sa safety taken into account? How does that work? Well, we, we actually, uh, in all our, all our companies where safety is an issue, for example, all our manufacturing companies, that's the first slide in every one of our board decks. Right. Because and, and, and from a very selfish point of view, if we keep everybody safe, they will be happy to do better work, but it's, it's, it's incumbent upon us to provide, and to make sure the company is providing a safe working environment for everybody. So to us, without, the financial returns have to come after that. Um, but really, our job is to, is to drive returns for, for our LPs. That, that, that's what we try to do. We take into consideration those other things, but really in the context of trying to drive the best returns we can for our LPs. Uh, and driving returns is 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 exactly. I mean, that's that's the whole ball game. I mean, that that's why we're here. And and as as a lawyer, what what we preach to uh, our private equity group clients and anyone else who will listen to us is uh, the fact that uh, the diligence process on the sales side is absolutely critical. Uh, yeah, everybody knows the way the process works. Uh, you're, you're frequently being forced to give uh, either indications of interest or bids before you've done full diligence. Uh, on the sales side, that creates a lot of danger. I mean, there's, there's a benchmark uh, as to you know, what the business could be worth, but every single thing that comes up is a potential ding to purchase price. So when Jim says he focuses on safety, you got to focus on safety because if you get in there and you find out that workers' comp claims are through the roof uh, or OSHA is all over the business, that's going to be a serious, serious weight on the value of the company. So you know, when you talk about sustainability and you talk about other kind of socially conscious methodologies of investing, uh, there are people out there who, who may, very well may be willing to uh, compromise uh, re, the ultimate return for uh, socially conscious uh, investing. Uh, I put that as, as something a little different from something like safety. Uh, if you're not taking care of your workers, you're not making sure you're in, uh, generally in compliance with law, uh, particularly the important ones like OSHA, uh, like uh, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, et cetera. I, buyer's gonna find it, buyer's gonna hammer you on purchase price, and you're gonna pay uh, dearly for that failure. Yeah. All right, um, so next one for our private equity guys. What process do you go through to, de to develop your deal pipeline, um, I I specifically in the current market? Uh, I feel like th this is kind of different variation of what we discussed before, I guess. Yeah, I mean, um, 
you know, we, we will see the, you have a, you, as a concept, you have a funnel, you, you'll look at, you'll pick at a thousand, you know, ideas or companies a year. I, I think that um, the business, uh, and Jim's got an interesting model where they have people dedicated to this, is it, gotten so competitive that you need to be out looking around proactively. And so you, you build relationships with bankers to help with deal flow. Um, you have great relationships with good lawyers and, and accountants and, and to help with opportunities. But really what we're trying to do is go out and meet companies directly mm -hmm. and, and get to know founders and owners mm -hmm. before a process. Because if the first time you're meeting a management team is at a management dinner or presentation, you're, you're pretty much dead in the water because, you know, the, you, you need, this is about building relationships, as Jim was saying earlier, winning ties at the end of the day because of the work you've done. So we do a lot of proactive work, uh, as I think the whole industry is trying to do, to generate deal flow. Um, and so we kind of think about it in buckets of, you know, here's the stuff from bankers that we're going to see. Here's the stuff that we're going to proactively try to go out and originate. And then we're going to build away from bankers, relationships with executives and lawyers and accountants to try to generate ideas and, and longer term prospects. I mean, deal flow is it's the lifeblood of everything that a private equity firm does. Because right. uh, if you don't have it, you really don't have much. Right. Mm -hmm. So we, we've dedicated four out of our total of 17 people to, to nothing but sourcing transactions. They're business development guys. So they're calling on everything from uh, really professional bankers at one end to a guy and his dog who's a broker working out of the basement and everything in between. Lawyers, accountants, you name it. Any place that we can build relationships because we want to get a lot of looks at things. And, and like Ken said, we're trying as often as possible to visit a company before a process. We very often get, particularly from brokers and some of these smaller businesses, very sketchy information on the business. But we've been doing it a long time. So we have a pretty good sense, yeah, maybe there's something there. So we'll go see a company when we don't have anything close to complete information. Again, because we want to meet the founder of the business, understand the seller's motivations, and see whether there's a way that we can help that company, whether it's a good situation or not. So we spend a, a, a really hugely disproportionate amount of time uh, on that stage of the process, probably more than uh, any other firm of our size that we're aware of because of uh, how important it is. A proprietary deal flow is really the holy grail. And, uh, I, I've actually been very surprised recently. Uh, a number of the sales side transactions I've worked on, uh, the client has approached us. They already have a buyer. Uh, and from, as a fiduciary, I suggested, yeah, have you spoken to a couple of investment bankers? No, 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 this is the right buyer for us. Uh, okay, how do you know that? Well, you know, they're a customer, they know us, or, or we supply, the, uh, yeah, they, they supply us, I mean, whatever it is. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's very interesting, uh, and, and, and I don't know if you guys are seeing this, but how many founders uh, really, uh, I don't know, they're, they're allergic to paying investment banker fees or something, <laughs> and they, they, I mean, they, they, it's great opportunity for you guys because you know, they're, they're, they're happy with the buyer and they, they, they just want a, a, a fair deal. And if you can get that and avoid that auction process, you guys are, are, are at least a couple of turns probably ahead of the game. No, we, we could be. I think it's funny that, that, you, that comment because I think the, the only uh, profession with a worse name than private equity perhaps is investment banker. <laughs> <laughs> Lawyers. <laughs> it's all a tie. Those are, those okay. are terminology uh, for ties. <laughs> so I'm curious, and again, Bruce, I feel like you can answer this along with our PE folks. If you're going to pay a higher premium for a company that's already operationally efficient, how do you justify the need to pay, rather, how do you justify the need to increase operational efficiency just to pay down PE issued debt? Does that make sense? Well, I don't think you're, if, if I understand your question, um, I, I, I don't think you're, you're, you're driving even greater efficiency just to pay down debt. Mm -hmm. was, that, was that your question? Right. I think you're driving efficiency for uh, two reasons. Uh, you're, you're, you're driving it for the, uh, the growth and the profitability that it creates in and of itself. And there may be, I mean, you may say, if, if your point is for every million dollars you spend on operational efficiency, uh, the initial return may be 3x, but by the time uh, you're talking about your situation, it's only 1x or something, or well, it better be more than 1x, yeah, maybe 1.2x or something. Uh, is, is, is that really worth it? Well, uh, I, I would think when you're talking about a, a 5, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14 uh, multiple of EBITDA, 
every dollar of EBITDA you can generate through efficiencies is going to come back to you in spades. But the other thing is, to the extent that funds are able to pay down debt, uh, they are increase, They are using leverage to increase returns to their limited partners. And at the end of the day, that's, that's why pegs are in business. Right. You, guys, mean, you guys agree with that? Yeah, I mean, look, the, the, the game is we're trying to make the company as valuable as we can. It's not really more complicated than that. Yep. That was better put. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. See, I get paid by the word. So. <laughs> um, from an operational improvement perspective, which functions or processes do PE firms focus on the most? Um, Ken? Yeah, um, you know, we touched on this earlier, John, a little bit. I mean, it's it really dependent on the situation. Um, we will we'll have our little playbook. I mean, literally, you know, you're, you're, let's take a look at every phase of the business. Let's look at supply chain, procurement, pricing, Salesforce effectiveness, lean, working capital. I mean, you can run through the list. Um, it totally depended on the situation. You know, I hate to be vague in that answer, but I, I mean, I, I think it's, it yeah. I think what we, what, as I said before, we've done is we're almost always replacing the CFO, and we always want to drive growth in, yeah. er, in, every, in every, almost every deal that we're in. Uh, so it is, not, it is pretty common for us to invest in sales and marketing because these are companies that generally haven't done that. Right. It, it, it's just an obvious opportunity, so we take it. But we've certainly invested in some companies that do that very well and some other things not so well. All right. you, there's been a lot said about having the right systems or having preferred systems. What about systems that are not preferred? What, what do you avoid? Well, systems, that's all. We could spend another hour on that topic. I mean, <laughs> and, and it's just true we're across the board in mid market businesses. I mean, and so it's, it's a hard one to answer again, but um, we, we will buy a lot of businesses that have disparate systems, acquisitions they brought in where the systems are completely different. I mean, ultimately, we're trying to work with that piece of clay, make it as efficient as possible, and then drive. Um, a good set of KPIs, which hopefully the management team's already put in place. Mm -hmm. we, we had a business that was really struggling with communication between sales, engineering, and ops. They were doing no capacity planning, no production planning, and consequently, you know, they, their cost of quality was high, the on-time delivery was lousy, and we, we instituted systems that really fundamentally changed that and, mm -hmm. and was a big driver of the success, ultimately, of that business. So, you know, systems are critical, but what we, we inherit a lot of the time is, <laughs> I mean, you know, is, is, and you, even on this, on this we, we, the business we bought last year had no audit, no audit financials. I mean, really difficult financial situation. You'll see a lot of that. A lot of that. Yeah. All right. If you, you, you can also look at it the other way if you're talking about uh, uh, an investment in technology. I mean, one of the worst mistakes uh, anyone can make is, is actually over investing in technology that provides for lots of growth, but it's too complicated. Mm -hmm. And you see that a lot, uh, a, a lot more, maybe not in the middle market, but, but in the upper market, these very complicated ERP systems that manufacturer after manufacturer spent hundreds of millions of dollars to implement and then had to scrap because nobody understood how to use them and they weren't getting the data they wanted out of them. Uh, I, it, it, so that example is not you know, a very good middle market example, but the concept is uh, just as, as putting systems in place can really uh, be the jump start to your business, uh, overburdening your business with technology isn't necessarily the best idea either. Yeah, that actually reminds me of one of my favorite newsroom jokes, and coincidence, coincidentally, it's also the only one we can tell on camera, which is, what do you call technology that works? Obsolete. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to come back to you guys for this, yeah. and also you, Bruce, but we're really looking more at a PE perspective. Yep. How long should private equity owners give a particular operational strategy to prove effective? I, I feel like you might say that it, it's kind of on an ad hoc basis again. We say a lot of it depends, doesn't it? <laughs> we'll That's our that. favorite answer. <laughs> I don't know. I, don't, I really don't know how to answer that question. Yeah, uh, it's some. Or, or um, better yet, how do you know that it's working? Maybe. Well, we generally, when we have a plan, uh, we, we generally set up guideposts. We're gonna. We, we, this is where we think we need to be in three months or six months or a year. Uh, but we've had so, some companies. Well, you, you can be in a situation where you set up a great plan, mm -hmm. but other things go awry in the business that that slow you down. I mean, we all went through that in 2008, 2009, 2010. And had we abandoned some of the projects completely that we had in mind before we went through this big dip in the market, it would have been a mistake. So look, we, we reevaluate whatever plan we put in place on a regular basis. 
And we're always looking at, are we being successful in these things? And we try to hit our guideposts, but you have to, you have to be um, adaptable to whatever the situation is. Well, one thing that's been helpful in monitoring you know, progress is we, what we call PMO, put a project management office in place, mm -hmm. and which will be run by, uh, spearheaded by a, a senior manager at the company, but we'll also have an interface with someone on the board, typically one, one of, someone from 3i. And, and that's been helpful in, in, in just really trying to be disciplined about are we truly making progress with some of these initiatives. And it could be as, as simple as CapEx to a more complicated operational initiative. There are going to be certain operational initiatives that are going to lend themselves, as I said earlier, to, you know, so pricing, a price increase. You know, you ought to be able to see the pretty quickly how that's going. Procurement, you know, if you have that plan in place, you know, how are you doing against that? Other things like Salesforce effectiveness could take, you know, a year plus to really see the yeah. benefits. So it depends. All right. Um, if, and I realize some folks in P don't speak about this, but if you're focusing on a dividend recap kind of early on, uh, A, does it maybe hinder PE managers when they need to focus on operational improvements, or B, are you already aware that you're working with a healthy enough business that you're not going to trip it up? You know, it's interesting because I think the, the perception of, we, we, you know, thankfully we call ourselves private equity now versus leveraged buyout, but I mean, it, and debt's a necessary part of this game, but, um, it's not a big part of how we think about things day to day. I mean, no. it's just kind of there. But at mm -hmm. the end of the day, if debt becomes a distraction in and of itself, and that can be, the, the div recap in a market like this is, is pretty efficient in how you're getting that done. So it's not, a, you know, it can be a little bit of a distraction for a CFO mm -hmm. and maybe a, 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 a week worth of time for, or less for a CEO. So typically it's not a big distraction. I think the bigger issue is when you get sideways because you have, you're, you're not performing well and the debt is an overhang. Because, you know, the, theoretically the discipline of debt should drive better, you know, performance and where you go with the business. When it gets to be a distraction, and then that's a problem. I think that's much more the case when a business isn't performing well than it right. is with a dividend recap. We've, we've rarely done dividend recaps. Right. Uh, our, we, our leverage is relatively low in most of our transactions. If we're approaching four times, that's pretty high leverage for us. Right. Um, and the fact is because most of the businesses we invest in are relatively rapid growers, um, we're almost always taking the cash flow and rather than paying down debt or paying it out as a dividend, we're investing in acquisitions or in uh, or organic projects to drive growth. So it just hasn't really, uh, it really hasn't taken up a lot of my thinking because we don't do it very often. Uh, we're, we're beginning to run out of time now, so I want to turn it into one of our uh, viewer questions. Um, and, and as for private equity folks, what is your process for developing a management team and what do you look for in outside talent? I feel like you can probably answer this because you've already said the CFO is in trouble as soon as you buy them. Well, most of the time. Not always. We, we, we have, we, That's a we, we've had, we've had some, we've had, uh, we've acquired some, some good um, CFOs. Generally these companies though just really aren't very well developed in the finance function. Right. Uh, really it's so much about culture. Um, is you can have a person who's really talented but if he's a bit abrasive in certain circumstances, no matter how, he good, how good he is, the way I, the analogy I use is the organism will reject him. Right. He's got to be somebody who'll be accepted by that management team. Or otherwise, no matter how talented the person is, he or she will not be effective. So it's really, f there's a certain level of competence that we look for in whatever the position is. Culture is incredibly important. And that's, that's the thing we spend mo more time agonizing about uh, than you know, can this person do the job. Right, and yet soft skills is never on the B-School syllabus. Uh, no, not so much. Yeah. I mean, 20 years of doing this, I mean, it is the issue. And, you it's know, the hardest and thing it's, we do. It's, it's, many, it's very <laughs> instinctual. I mean, there, are, yeah, you can do, we now have a management assessment program that will, you know, the senior managers will, will work together and, and, and do that, how they fit together. But I mean, half of the time that's right and half the time it's wrong. It's, I mean, <laughs> it, it's very instinctual how this is all going to work together. Um, and um, when you get it right, it typically means you're going to have a good investment. When you get it wrong, you're going to struggle. Yeah, that's right. Um, we're out of viewer questions, so I've got one of my own. Um, how often or regularly do you specifically solicit staff input as you look to make management or operational improvements? Or maybe is, are you kind of viewing things from a financial perspective as opposed to a, an internal management issue? Well, all of these are internal management issues. We, uh, I think um, Ken said it before, we, we, we operate in a collaborative fashion. We work with management. Mm -hmm. It's very, very rare for us to dictate management, you need now to do this. Mm -hmm. It just isn't the way we operate. In fact, it's probably not generally a very effective way to operate. Um, everybody needs to believe in the things that we're doing. Uh, we had uh, an example of one company 
uh, where we acquired a, a very good company. In fact, they were a world-class manufacturer of the products they make, but they had one new product that they were selling with an independent rep to one distributor. Mm -hmm. And we looked at that and said, it, it, it cries out for a different name, a sales force, investment, for a lot of things. But this is a company that had, had, had no, really no concept of sales and marketing. They, they, they sold a lot of products because they made great ones. Mm -hmm. But we knew, we knew it would benefit from that. But it took us a year to get the CEO to figure out that it was his idea to put in place the sales and marketing and investment they'd never done before. And he takes complete credit for it, and I'm thrilled for that. <laughs> yeah. But that's what you have to do. You have to work with somebody so that we all believe in what we're trying to do. All right. Any points Same, for you? Uh, not, not much to add there. I mean, it's all about collaboration, buy-in, and working together. Locking arms on this. I also don't have much to add myself. I'm sure our viewers might. Um, they, they did submit some more questions. Maybe they'll follow up with you individually. Uh, Ken Hanau, partner with 3i. Jim Anderson, co-founder, managing partner with Cleaver Capital. Bruce Fenton, partner with Pepper Hamilton. Hamilton. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us in our studio today. We appreciate you taking out some time to do this. Viewers also, thank you for taking out some time to watch us today. We're going to be back a little bit later this summer with some more webcasts and webinars. But that's it for today. Thank you very much for joining us.